Welcome everyone. The invitation to chair this plenary session was daunting when Frank offered it to me a month ago. Obviously it became much more so last Thursday when Russia's invasion of Ukraine took place. Since the invasion, the arts sprung into headlines with cancellations of contracts and performances by Russian artists associated with Putin. Choreographers left new works unfinished. Ballet dancers traded their costumes for camouflage. And as of yesterday, the life work of a Ukrainian folk artist was destroyed by Putin's forces. One might be tempted to dismiss the arts as frivolous, unnecessary at a moment like this. And in fact, during the darkest days of the pandemic, many artists found their livelihoods and careers upended. However, we know that at the very basic level of human communication and interaction, mutual trust is at the core and artists and their work are central to the trust building enterprise. Using a metaphor from my own discipline as a choreographer and founder of Battery Dance in New York, working with youth across religious, ethnic, and political boundaries, we are unable to dance with each other until and unless we can trust and respect each other. Battery Dance has been an ambassador of culture, a cultural diplomat of America in 70 countries, collaborating with local counterparts in bilateral projects and often with funding from international foundations and government agencies, in addition to the U.S. Department of State and American embassies around the world. Addressing the pandemic and the damage it has wrought from firsthand perspective, Battery Dance's intensive programs in Nigeria and Dubai were canceled when COVID surged. Our work in New York City public schools came to an end when students weren't able to attend live in their schools. But with the benefit of a young, innovative, and highly motivated team, we invented an online platform, producing over 1,000 programs during the first year of the pandemic, garnering an audience of 1.5 million digital views across 206 countries. Our teaching artists were in their homes in the U.S. on Zoom, conducting workshops with refugees and German students in mixed groups who gathered safely in parks and large halls, wearing masks, but integrating creatively. Right here in the Western Hemisphere, we recorded 30 Spanish language dance classes that have been shown repeatedly over Bolivian satellite television. We're not new to working in conflict zones, whether performing and teaching during the Sri Lankan Civil War, where our hotel was bombed soon after we checked out, or in Kinshasa with gunshots as a percussive accompaniment to our dance workshops, or in San Pedro Sula, where the joy and exhilaration of the hundred youth with whom we worked belied the New York Times characterization of the city as the most dangerous in the world. To address the topic of our panel, reimagining American cultural diplomacy in war and pandemic, we have a brilliant group of panelists who will share their perspective in five minute presentations after which we'll open it up for a conversation and address questions from the audience. To lead us off, we have Nicholas Cull, a historian and public and cultural diplomacy expert and international speaker who has written numerous papers and books and is a professor in the public diplomacy program at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. Nick, let's have your presentation. Thanks, Jonathan, and glad to speak, speak in, in such good company. I, I come at this issue of cultural diplomacy uh, as a historian of the role of culture and communication in foreign policy, and someone who's been called on to analyze policy and once or twice to give some advice. I define cultural diplomacy as the attempt to advance foreign policy goals through activities in the cultural sphere. And this can include arts diplomacy, sharing the best of our artistic life uh, with a foreign audience. It could be capacity building work, teaching a language, a cuisine or a martial art to a foreign public or assisting another country in the cultural sphere, collaborating and exchanging with them uh, on an equal basis to co-create something that hasn't existed before. Now, uh, cultural diplomacy used to be a major element in American foreign policy, but it has struggled and been neglected in recent years. I, I'm just back from the expo 
in Dubai. And uh, there's a lot of cultural diplomacy on display in, in that place. Um, but uh, the spectacle of an Emirati donor having to pay for the United States to have a pavilion at Expo 2020 does seem to me to be saddening. Uh, it reminds me a little of the bit at the end of that old movie, El Steed, where they tie the uh, dead knight onto his horse just to have the benefit of his involvement in one last battle. I'm heartened to learn that there are plans to build a regular appropriation for expos uh, into uh, coming years, but I know that every uh, every time appropriations are reviewed, cultural diplomacy is, is uh, subject to particular scrutiny. And so as I, as I look to uh, upcoming developments and roles for cultural diplomacy, uh, I'm unsure if I'm actually uh, talking about something that will be taken up in the United States, but I do feel that there are lessons for all countries uh, here. The first thing to say is that we're living in an era of tremendous challenges. There's renewed global competition, including uh, the violence we've seen over the last week of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But more than this, we face problems that are bigger than the capacity of any one country to solve. Kofi Annan used to say that these were the problems without passports, and that when problems don't have passports, solutions can't have passports either. We're going to have to work together to solve problems like climate, like uh, mass migration and inequality. I think cultural diplomacy can help here in, in two ways. First, that in an era when countries are newly endangered, I think that reputation can build a, deg a degree of security. In fact, uh, I, I don't personally talk about soft power anymore. I prefer to talk about reputational security, a quality that even the poorest country can uh, seek to develop. Places that are known and admired around the world can be and are more supportive when crises occur. In fact, I think we've had a demonstration of this uh, over the last week. Think of the difference between the attitude to Ukraine in 2014 when Putin attacked and the attitude today. You can see how a young country, uh, from the point of view of independence, uh, can benefit from uh, being better known and having a clearer established narrative in the global imagination so that today no one doubts that uh, Ukraine is a place uh, distinct from Russia with its own traditions and uh, its own way of life that needs to be protected and, uh, and secure. Very good for me. The second uh, uh, point that I want to make is about uh, this need for cooperation and for collaboration. We know that if we are to cooperate and to collaborate, we need to be able to trust. We cannot solve problems only by working with our friends. We need to bring new countries into partnership, and even we have to work with people we have historically mistrusted. Culture is a way to build habits of cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and uh, I think this is no time to turn our backs on cultural diplomacy, but rather it's a time to revive the kind of habits of cultural diplomacy, cooperation, collaboration, and <clears throat> dialogue that have served us so well uh, in the past. That, that's great, Nick. Thank you so much. We're going to come back to that topic uh, after our presentations for a more a joint conversation. Uh, thank you for setting that up for us. Switching it up from historian to hip hop, we have artist, entrepreneur, and cultural diplomacy practitioner, Junius Brickhouse, who heads up Next Level, the Department of State's hip hop cultural diplomacy program, as well as founder of his own urban artistry in the Washington DC area. Junius, share your story. Peace and blessings, good folks. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Jonathan. Um, as Jonathan has said, um, I am the director of Next Level and um, we are a hip hop diplomacy initiative um, funded by 
the U.S. Department of State and administered um, by our friends at Meridian International Center here in Washington, D.C. Um, so many things going on, you know, a good friend of mine used to always say, um, what do you do when the music stops? Well, um, diplomacy is what I do um, <laughs> when, when the music stops. And this initiative at Next Level has been something that um, I've been part of since 2014, um, in the first year. And I started as an artist educator um, visiting Senegal um, with a team of artists. Now, that experience was so profound to me, it, it motivated me in a different way. Now, I had done Envoys prior to um, Next Level, but the urgency of reaching out to communities globally that we already have relationships with and trying to build healthy relationships is, is what I wanted to do and it's what um, this opportunity allows me to do. As director, um, I can look back and see we visit 34 countries um, for multiple weeks, conducted programming here in the United States, um, bringing different artists and student collaborators here to learn a little bit more about us and what is behind hip hop when the music stops. Hip hop, not as a music or entertainment form, but hip hop as a culture. Um, the way that we dress, the way that we speak, the way that we live. Perhaps it's this idea of collective marginality, or maybe it's just people who are interested in learning about people from the United States. But this program is allowing us to make a lot of headway. And I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't say that my work at Next Level is informed by my past life. Um, at one point in time, I used to be Sergeant Junius Brickhouse, headquarters, Allied Force Command in Heidelberg, Germany, which was a NATO unit. Um, I served in the military for the best part of 10 years. And upon um, discharging, I stayed doing Department of Defense and Depart Department of Justice work for an additional 11 years as a, as a contractor. I have seen firsthand in four different war zones what war does. And I don't mean destruction of infrastructure and toppling of governments. I mean what it does to people, civilians, to have uniformed armed personnel from other countries walking through your streets. It makes me ask myself, why do we wait so late to teach those same people the things that soft diplomacy at large can do. We have to depend on our governments to make those decisions at that point. I had, a, I had some things to, to talk about and it was scripted, but today I'm, I'm in a different place and um, I felt that I, I needed to speak from my heart. Well, thank you, Junius. I think your perspective is something that uh, I don't know anyone else who could who could speak from those different points of view. And I really appreciate it. And I know that you're doing great work. So thank you. Um, 
Moving on, the explosive title, Satchmo Blows Up the World, says a lot about our next panelist. Penny Von Eschen from the University of Virginia, an historian of American cultural diplomacy and author who is coming out with a new book, Paradoxes of Nostalgia, Cold War Triumphalism and Global Disorder Since 1989. It's published by Duke University Press. Don't be scared. Penny knows how to engage her readers. She makes this very, very tough material, very readable and cogent. I can speak for that. Satchmo Blows Up the World is like a Bible to me. So Penny, it's over to you. Um, so, so kind, Jonathan, and just an honor to be with all of these amazing people. So let me just say very quickly. Um, so I'm at University of Virginia. I met Jonathan when I was at Michigan some years ago, and I then did a stint at Cornell. Um, and I just want to say two quick words about the work. So Sasha Blows Up the World was um, an amazing experience for me to work on. It, it's about the jazz musicians, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Dave Brubeck, who were pulled into the State Department programs in the Cold War and made it their own. And they, they didn't follow the script and they did something dazzling that became a later model for cultural programs. Um, this kind of heavy title I have, and you know, and thank you, Jonathan, because I, I do think it's more accessible, I hope, than it sounds, but it, it's really about the unraveling of that diplomacy to the extent that I would call it. I, I track the emergence of a, a growing disdain for the very idea of diplomacy and in popular culture, what I actually call a people-to-people -people undiplomacy. So um, I will come back to that, but um, I, I, I think, you know, again, like following Nick, um, just conditions of trust, following, um, you know, following, you know, um, just following the idea of, of just hip hop and, and an idea of what culture can do in the absence of culture, we're going to fall into undiplomacy and, 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 and militarism. And so I want to tell a very quick story. And this has always been a really important story to me um, in the, it only happened really 10 years ago, but it follows it kind of, for me, bridges these books and, and a big part of my life and it involves people here. So in 2013, I, to my great elation, I was invited of Central Asia, which would not have existed without Leon Borsti and Bard College and your collaboration with the State Department and the State Department and George Soros. And these are my heroes of cultural diplomacy, um, people to come together with a relatively no strings attached idea of cultural diplomacy to put resources into the hands of people from a very bottom up way. And when, as I was going, um, and back to Satchmo, um, I, I, I was very, very profoundly fortunate to have become friends with musicians, including Randy Weston and Dave Brubeck and Iola Brubeck, and Dave Brubeck had passed. And there was going, there was, his memorial was in New York City, St. John's of Divine Church, May 13th. And that was exactly when I was in Bishkek. And um, that whole experience was so important to me. And so I thought, well, I want to go to Bishkek. What am I going to do? I reached out to American University Central Asia. Um, who are your friends in the jazz community? The State Department was doing jazz, um, international jazz festivals. So it had followed a jazz festival in May, um, a spectacular festival in Kyrgyzstan. And, and they said, oh my goodness, we'd love to do something for, with Dave Brubeck and let's partner with Alexander um, Yurtov and his daughter, Victoria Yurtava, who are Brubeck, classical and jazz musicians, and especially Alexander. So the local community, with the help of the embassy and myself just and the university just put together this amazing memorial to Brubeck and honoring the local jazz musicians. And to, this just exemplifies, you put 
some resources in the hands of bottom up creative artists and spectacular things will happen. Um, and, um, and I just think that it's so deeply important to remember that. And so many of the musicians of these earlier eras and to, to the current period can articulate that so well. And so, and I just want to say, I'm not, I, I'm going to be quick and I, I, I don't, I certainly don't want to go over time, but you're um, close. You're close, Penny. So, uh, so one second. So it's been a tragedy to watch this dismantling of diplomacy. And I think that, um, and I think the vacuum um, of the governments, and I just say one more sentence. Once, and I. Whoops. Just when Wait, Penny is going to say the important thing, she freezes. Yes. You froze, Penny. Repeat it, please. Okay. Americans enormously admired Soviet classical music, ballet, hockey, as Russian, as Soviet people admired American jazz. Now, if you go into popular, there are, you know, nasty, in, in the absence of a infrastructure that supports mm -hmm. culture, there are, again, what I call people to people on diplomacy, sort of nasty fights carried out through video game formats, through... Um, you know, through online videos. So I'll just end because I don't want to go over time with um, it's absolutely critical back to Nick that people develop trust. The people to people bottom up diplomacy was so profoundly important in bringing an imagination that brought the end to an earlier form of hostilities. And it's going, it, we will never bring another another vision, another future without putting that at the center. Thank you. What a good uh, segue to our next speaker. Um, we've been referencing the Department of State and actually Penny froze for a minute, but she was talking about a jazz festival in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, which uh, was facilitated by Bard College. One of our next speakers is the president and by the State Department. So we're seeing these circles come together. So we have David Kennedy, a senior foreign service officer who served in India, Ethiopia, and more. His current position as chief of citizen exchanges as part of the State Department's Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs puts him at the center of our topic this evening. David, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Jonathan, for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. The talent on this virtual stage is, is humbling indeed, and I'm proud to be part of it. What I bring to this forum are examples of diplomacy at work on behalf of the American people, even under some of the most challenging circumstances we have encountered. When these remarks were first drafted, we were thinking about the two years with COVID. Now, of course, the focus of the world is on the Russian, Russia's brutal, of ad invasion of Ukraine. I won't speak directly to that very much, but I would like to share some thoughts about exchange programs and conflict. And I'm reminded of a colleague, many of you may know, who will go unnamed for now, with whom I worked early on on a cultural visit exhibit in the USSR, who suggested exchange programs are born out of conflict and the resolve of people to do something to prevent future conflict, reduce misunderstanding and hatred, and address needs in the world. At the State Department, 80 years of the International Visitor Leadership Program and 75 years of the Fulbright Program have done that. And these are, and there are so many other examples. Some of you have mentioned that during the Cold War, the jazz ambassadors, Dizzy Gillespie, Sarah Vaughan, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Dave Brubeck, Benny Goodman, and others built international friendships by sharing uniquely American music that helped others understand the democratic, open-minded, creative nature of the United States. The Harlem Globetrotters were named ambassadors of extraordinary goodwill following a 1951 trip to Berlin. An encounter across a ping pong table helped thaw relations between the U.S. and China in the 70s, the Philadelphia Orchestra was the first U.S. orchestra to travel to Europe after World War II and will travel later this month 
to the UAE to conduct master classes, offer workshops, meet fellow musicians, and be among the final U.S. performances at Expo Dubai. Cultural diplomacy is not unique to the government, and that is important to emphasize. It happens in many extravaganzas and small moments, like the opening of Saturday Night Live last week, which featured a moving rendition of the Prayer for Ukraine by Ukrainian chorus Dumka of New York. We don't know how the conflict between Ukraine and Russia will end, but I can tell you is that we are already considering how we can use cultural exchanges to build bridges and help heal. Cultural diplomacy is one of the most important and most effective ways the State Department and its embassies abroad engage directly with people around the globe. Secretary Blinken was exactly right when he said cultural exchange programs are crucial diplomatic tools that increase cross-cultural understanding and demonstrate shared values, create space for discussions and dialogue between different countries and cultures. I've worked with Jonathan. I've worked, I'm very pr proud to be on the same stage with Junius. And there's no other way that me that can rival how cultural engages people and opens opportunities. In ECA, we are conveners. We bring people together around the globe. Our people-to-people -people exchange programs support foreign policy and national security priorities. Each ECA program, whether it focuses on sports, the arts, or education, is designed to support our most important objectives. And these include our foreign policy priorities, just to name a couple, including right now promoting diversity and inclusion, certainly promoting democracy and countering disinformation, bolstering our economy and cultivating cultural awareness. But foreign policy is for all Americans. When COVID hit, ECA pivoted immediately to virtual programming and we succeeded. In 2019, we conducted 1,240 projects, engaging through over 360,000 participants. In 2020, it was 1,044, engaging well over 100,000 participants. And again in 2021, over 1,000 projects with about 200,000 participants. In short, we did not stop engaging the world. We think that nothing replaces an in-person people-to-people exchange. That's why we are in this business. No, no doubt about that. But we've been schooled by COVID into adapting to a variety of other, uh, other models and opportunities to help our embassy colleagues remain in touch with audiences and engage new ones. We've become quickly adaptive to address the inevitable technical glitches, and we've we learned to be patient. In the earliest days of the COVID isolation, to address the theme of this, the original theme, we delivered packages of curated programs for colleagues in the field who are less, who are also trying to figure out how to program when gatherings weren't possible. And as everyone adapted to shifting circumstances, we were able to introduce more live elements, create hybrid programs that incorporate tape segments to minimize issues with lags and transmission. Virtual programming is here to stay, and there's no doubt about that. It has allowed us to reach audience that we would never have reached or would rarely reach, even with in-person travel. And geography stretches endlessly and budgets don't. Virtual programs help us make the most of limited resources. That was referred to, unfortunately, they're limited. But they also allow us to extend what might be one week in-person exchanges to a weeks-long or even months-long interaction, just like we are doing this evening. We are cautiously and happily returning to in-person programs, country by country. We have musicians from Latin America tour in the United States now. We are in Morocco right now. We are planning more programs. Our decision-making process remains centered, of course, on the health and safety of all participants. But at the same time, we will continue to use virtual platforms to break the ice before an artist, athlete, or group arrives and to continue the interaction. So thank you very much, Jonathan, and all the panelists. I look forward to learning more from more comments.
from the panelists and from our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And thank you to all of the cultural diplomats who are serving overseas, um, some of them in, in a lot of uh, difficult situations, let's put it that way. Um, carry on. So let me pass the virtual microphone to Ellen Perlman, an artist and innovator and cultural diplomacy practitioner who brings cutting edge tools to bear in her collaborations with artists and technologists across the world. Ellen. Yes, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm also a, a Fulbright uh, specialist in art, media and technology, which means I get um, parachuted into countries to help them get up to speed in such things as VR, AI, NFTs, you know, you name it, I'm all over it. I'm very fluent in these areas. And I worked with Jonathan on a project uh, where we had to pivot to a virtual studio in three weeks uh, inside uh, a closet in Battery Dance with a global community. But what I do want to talk about because of the current world situation is um, I want to say I have been in Russia. I worked with Russian artists. I've done artist residencies in Russia, and I'm very involved in the art scene and art and tech scene in Russia. Uh, a year and a half ago, um, I was a zero one American arts incubator artist to Ukraine and the pandemic hit and we uh, became virtual. And I worked with uh, four groups of artists in Ukraine on virtual reality, artificial uh, intelligence, and especially deep fakes, which we called synthetic media. And we made four projects. Um, since then, you know, I've, um, my, my students, although they're all, you know, professionals, um, uh, have been posting on Facebook uh, what's been going on. And one of them, Olaya, um, who was very savvy with synthetic media, has been broadcasting live from her basement in Kharkiv. And The Guardian just picked up on her and has been running her uh, and featuring her. And uh, some newspapers in Austria now have been featuring her. And I've also worked with Izzia which is a, um, a cultural new media center that was in Donetsk and moved to Kiev. And an hour before I got on this call, I was in touch with both uh, Olaya and Mikhail from Izzia going, well, you know, Russia just banned Facebook, so you guys better get ready. And do you have a VPN? And if not, let me, um, which is virtual private network, can I recommend a few to you that you should get now? Because uh, when uh, this situation is over, you might find your access limited. And so I've been sending them and I'm in contact with them almost daily um, you know, and all of this strategizing how to work with media during these times, I'm not saying there was a one-on-one -on -one situation, but I will say that our encounters with understanding sophisticated implementations of synthetic media have certainly resonated with um, the artists who are staying behind in Ukraine. Now, was that my objective or any of our objectives going into this? No, we were just making art projects about new, you know, deep fakes and synthetic media. We had no objective. But I can guarantee you that lessons learned um, have started right now, uh, boots on the ground. And uh, that's pretty profound for me to see that playing out right now in real time. Um, you know, so when you when 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 it was mentioned about the Ukrainian chorus singing on uh, Saturday Night Live, I immediately sent that video to everyone in Ukraine. I mean, immediately they were, you know, everyone got it. So there is, uh, you know, the issue of media, cultural diplomacy um, and artistic responsibility, which is all I can talk about, is very profound in the creative arts community, and especially, you know, because it's the area I work in, in art and tech. 
um, because that's where the battlefield is in a way. It's information way and disinformation. And um, I'm very proud to have been a zero one American arts incubator artist without an agenda. There, uh, there was no agenda about this, but now seeing the results as of today of it's what- Incredible, happened. it's totally incredible. Ellen, yeah. congratulations and yeah. kudos to you for what you provided. Um, as you said, you couldn't have predicted yeah. the impact, but look at it. Yeah. So let's go now to a renowned conductor, musical scholar, Bard College president on Botstein. Under his leadership, Bard has created integrated programs with universities in Berlin, Vienna, Bishkek, and East Jerusalem, and its students study in nearly 50 countries each year. One could say that cultural diplomacy is second nature to Bard and to Dr. Botstein. So over to you, Leon. Well, th thank you for having me, and I want to thank my colleagues and Jonathan for organizing this. Um, so I want to divide the subject into two pieces. One is what I would call the area where there is an international um, set of understandings about how we value work in science, for example, um, and uh, in, let's say, the Fulbright or the exchange of students who are studying similar subjects and they're moving between countries what cultural diplomacy to me in that area that it is breaking down the national monopoly i'm no fan of nationalism i'm no fan of the political units as a musician i don't those political units are only important insofar as that they're my music so Julius's music for example comes out of his living experience and his living experience is a citizen of the united states and as a, as a person who who and I and we each of us is different in that regard, and that we are who we are. Are we representatives of a nation? I don't think so, because the nation is a construct, and it's not always an attractive one. I'm not loyal to the American flag. I am loyal to the way I read the Constitution, or the way Frederick Douglass read the Constitution, but I'm not loyal to the American flag. I'm not a nativist. And um, I don't like Ukrainian nativists or Russian nativists. The trouble, of course, is that the Russian nativists have more power, firepower than the Ukrainian na nativists. So the question is, cultural diplomacy is about pushing back on the monopoly of um, national identification. People are constructive scientists and they discover how uh, coronavirus works. They're not doing a national act. They're not representing a national. I find the Olympics a reprehensible thing. That's about individual achievement. It's not about national achievement. I'm not running for my nation. No one should. I'm not composing for my nation. It doesn't mean you're not a patriot. It doesn't mean you won't defend the nation. The cultural diplomacy is about the recognition that the things that divide us and bring us to war are at the end not the most important things. That the only way to make peace is to understand empathetically how much we are the same, not how different we are. That's the whole point of cultural diplomacy. Whether you're a musician or whether you're an artist or a video artist or you're a scientist. Now, the second point is America is in an anomalous circumstance. For us, cultural diplomacy is differently because the university system and the college system is not state funded. Our arts in the United States are not state funded. Furthermore, we have a huge commercial network that the entire world consumes in video, Hollywood, pop, all kinds of stuff. And in fact, people are extremely frightened that they're going to be Americanized. All the French are going to wear jeans and uh, everybody's going to sing the same songs and this kind of stuff. So uh, the cultural diplomacy for us is to show a different face of who we are. That we are a place in which um, a non-popular art form can thrive, one that isn't commercial, doesn't make a profit, is not about, um, it's not, and everything doesn't have to be a hit, um, that um, we're not a country that has only material values, only values about <clears throat> getting rich and famous. So the most famous artist of recent memory is not Michael Jackson. But actually, it can be people whose names um, aren't well known. Uh, Matthew O'Coin, the composer, you know, his opera is going up at the Met. He's not going to make any money from it. 
um, that it can be um, a, a theater person or a dance person or a movement person that isn't um, that requires private subsidy. It's not state subsidy. So in the areas where <clears throat> we can use cultural diplomacy is in the areas that commerce is not going to make it happen. Jazz is a good example. Jazz was never self-supporting. They never made enough money. They never made enough records. There was not enough of a public. It was not a commercial art. It is the greatest musical achievement historically in America. It was never a commercial art. They made money, okay, but they worked real hard for shows that didn't, or in playing in venues that didn't return a lot on the investment. A lot of great art needs to be paid, that requires patronage, and we're not operating as state patronage, even if you're a writer. So it seems to me that it's very important to show a different side of America, not the same side. In the other countries, most of them, like the Soviets, for example, it's all state funded. They're, they are state institutions. What's great about our cultural diplomacy, where it's a Fulbright, or is the State Department actually, to its credit, doesn't require us to carry a badge. So we're different from the military. If I'm a military officer, I represent my nation, I've agreed to do so. But if I'm being sent as an artist in some place, or a teacher, I say what I think. That's why I'm a proud American. That's why I'm a patriot. And therefore, it is the advance of the idea of democracy and also that the idea of human rights, the idea of things that we share in common, that we have a common concern for the way the planet either will or will not destroy itself, and that we can't do that alone by one nation. We have to do that together. Are we going to actually face like the COVID crisis? The great thing about we have started something called the Open Society University Network. So we began to give courses. We had students from Cameroon, from um, the uh, from South America, all on the same. We discovered this medium, right, is has a terrific add-on effect. It won't replace person to person. Never. Um, I think arts and teaching. I make the joke that it's um, it's like sex. Technology only improves it at the margins. The basic transaction always remains the same. Teaching has that been way, and performing has been that way, and making music. But it's very important that this technology has absolutely transformed our ability to communicate, especially if we mix it together with person to person. So the technology is made cultural diplomacy that much more practical and reasonable and affordable. But I think it's extremely important for the United States because it has to show who we are in a way that conventional national instruments don't and um, uh, and that uh, differentiate and also get people to understand that um, uh, we are really much more the same uh, and that's... Um, that's something that uh, is horrific about the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. The Russians, um, the brutality, the, in my view, the cruelty of it, uh, is predicated that um, uh, there is some kind of Russian destiny, some kind of Russian superiority, some kind of Russian right. Um, and this is um, a kind of, a, we had it ourselves in Manifest Destiny. But the fact remains that um, uh, it's also a public space that isn't controlled by any single government. Uh, an exhibit, a theater, a concert, a recording isn't public space. And that's why they want to close down Facebook and stuff like that. Not that Facebook is so terrific by any means. But it is very important that we do in the United States on the two sides, the university, student, the common ground of, of learning and education, terribly important. Because we're one of the rare places with the private higher education sector, but we also have a huge public sector. And that has to be shared in the world and cultural diplomacy is important for that. Fulbright is one of the best things. And the other is in the arts, uh, where I think um, music, of course, which is my own field, is um, is one of the few common grounds where people can realize that their sorrows they share in common and their solace they can share in common. Uh, and um, 
we're all mortal and we actually, the contours of our life are more um, overlapping than most political ideologies would like us to believe. So I, I think it's a terrific thing. And I do think the internet and COVID has taught us an important lesson about what can be done. Well, you know, we've run out of our original time. However, there are just so many themes that have been brought up. I'm not sure if anyone on the panel would like to react to someone else that, that, uh, because you do have the opportunity to do that. Um, I don't see any questions coming from our audience. I don't even know if they have the ability to do that. Um, but even you know, if I, there is an audience, John, pardon me, if there is an audience, there definitely is an audience. I see the audience. Um, yeah. So anyone on the panel want to um, address someone else on the panel? Well, uh, Jonathan, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, I, th I think that we need to take our inspiration from the sorts of things that those who oppose the values we share are against. And if Mr. Putin is against these things, we should be for them. If the Taliban are against these things, we should be for them. What are we doing debating whether or not this is the right thing to do? What are we doing debating whether or not these are the right ways of engaging publics uh, overseas? Of course it's right. Yes, but I think, Nick, you, you have to admit that Americans are extremely skeptical about any kind of spent in any kind of foreign policy. Yes. Uh, we, you know, uh, we, we unless it explodes something. That's uh, right. I think that part of the problem is uh, foreign policy is skewed by pork, by um, what's being built in someone's uh, uh, con constituency. And the uh, American cultural diplomacy has always benefited from having senators who were secure who actually care, had the luxury of caring about this stuff. So the great gift to the United States of Senator Fulbright, uh, having the, the uh, and, and a similar gift of, of um, uh, Senator Luger, who were prepared to uh, care about this. Whatever, whatever the, this is, this is a, we've had bipartisan heroes and bipartisan villains in this, in, in yes, this story. Nick, I, I don't know about the other people on the panel, but as a citizen of the country, I have to say for both parties that the quality of public service is not in the ascendancy. The quality of people going into public life is on the descent. Uh, no sane person would do it in the current internet world. And so we don't have people like Fulbright. I, I really have to respectfully disagree because like Junius um, and probably Ellen, when we go to um, small places, Laos, Honduras, wherever, and we find young American officers who I'm are not, not about Senator Jonathan. I'm not talking about. I'm talking about elected officials. Nick was talking about elected. Oh, officials. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Oh, I no. Let me, let me just continue with praising the fact that people who whose careers are not going to go rocket high because they did a battery dance, dancing to connect program, um, will 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 do the work and will be creative and and without that. We wouldn't be able to uh, to run our programs, and so I, you know, yeah, I, I take back my contradiction, Leon, because I didn't understand what you were saying. But now, but but I did want to say oh, yeah. how much I appreciate the people I've worked with overseas and during administrations where um, they really had to keep their heads down and they were not going to get prizes for doing culture. There have been, you know, there are people who who serve as ambassadors and as, as heads of, you know, front offices who don't appreciate culture, and yet some junior officers will go ahead and do it. No, so listen, I, I would say we've done a lot of work in the West Bank, in Russia, and in, in Kyrgyzstan, and we are completely grateful and dependent to the Foreign Service and State Department employees that made it possible. You're absolutely right. The people on the ground in the American part fantastic in east jerusalem when there was a consulate there it was absolutely indispensable and um we would never have survived in a big program there so you're absolutely right i was talking about the elected the the so people who created those programs by bringing them to congress you're you're correct about that well anyone else want to sort of throw something in the air and see what happens 
Um, I just want to say artists um, find each other around the world and they know what to do. And I have seen that everywhere. And, you know, the fact that the State Department has supported Americans in doing this is great, but artists find a way no matter what to do it. And so I, I feel, you know, the work that Junius, um, Jonathan and I do and Leon indirectly with, you know, bringing cultural events over via Bard. Um, and as I've said, I've, I know who some of those people are, which is very weird, but I know them. There's nothing like that. And that's the point. And I think this people to people connection, I'm not being sappy about it. You know, just let the artists find each other and interact with each other and and it will happen. There's well, no your, exam your example was so perfect because it's so clear you could not have predicted what would be happening with the tools that you were exploring with these counterparts in Ukraine. Just incredible. But Jonathan, I want to I want to because what what's a panel without controversy? I want to contradict this a little bit. The fact is dance companies, orchestras, corp large groups do require they don't find each other they really need help and that's where the state can be extremely important to send a dance ensemble to send um an ensemble of 50 musicians they're not going to find themselves going to another country so when you get the larger units of art the individual artist is helpless without real support and real patronage and some of it is big enough to require the state mm -hmm. Yeah. What I can think about vis-a-vis -vis the programs we've done is um, I see that one of our audience wants the mic. So let me see if I can give it to him. George Wang. Give you the mic, George. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, I'm a businessman, uh, not really a specialist in the uh, art. You know, right now I have friends uh, in Paris, in Beijing, with all the politics going on. You know, last year, the uh, grand opening of the Universal Studio in Beijing, <laughs> and the, all the Disneyland in Shanghai, that's something warm in between the U.S. and China. Even for the people, every day is a cold war, right? For the ordinary people, what the hell is going on every day? <sighs> anyway, whatever. So, but you know, you talk about a culture or something nice and warm. When the last year, when the Universal Studio opens up, there are gazillions of people going there. That's something. You know, it's kind of little warmth in the. Mood. Oh, yeah, yeah well, we've. I fun. think some of us have actually worked in in China. Um, yeah, and yeah. have had workshops with young people and explored yeah. our mm -hmm. shared creativity and vision. So on that level, um, it opens up a new world for us. And also it yeah. helps government get together. So we have the U.S. China Music Institute. We're the only institution where mm -hmm. we teach Chinese music and Chinese instruments to Americans mm -hmm. in the United States. And we have a collaboration with this Central Conservatory in Beijing. So music is sort of a narrow platform that with all the coldness and difficulty in politics and economics oh yeah we're talking uh, every day it's a cheerly thing they're playing all the games strangle each other oh my for the ordinary people you got the hope to bring some some humanity <laughs> deep in the heart in the culture so there's some link, you know. So. Thank you, George. I, I, this is a very good point, and it's great to have somebody from the audience coming in. Yeah, yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm not an expert in your wheel. No, no, no. I, I mean, you know, the whole point of cultural diplomacy is not we're talking. We're not just talking to professional peers. We're talking mm -hmm. to young people, many of whom have not had any opportunity to study the arts or be involved. We have another audience member coming in, Sundeep. Narwani, I'm yeah. giving you the mic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, George. 
So Sandeep, did I get you in? Yeah, I see a picture, yeah. Hi, I'm going to make it uh, very quick. Uh, I have a very specific question, uh, and that is uh, uh, on NFTs. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation around NFTs and, and peacemaking. Uh, can anyone throw some light on the future and how can we engage more with this new medium to initiate conversations that really matter and can shift going, uh, you know, going into a very critical phase? Thank you. Okay, did you say you NFTs and peacemaking? That's right. Okay. You heard um, uh, basically, what I can say in a nutshell is if you decentralize control, um, you have the potential to let peer-to-peer -peer dialogue happen. I'll, I'll keep it that simple. Okay. If I'm not sure that we gave the comprehensive answer you were looking for, Cindy, <laughs> but it's a brave new world. And I know that one of my colleagues, Jay Killa in Mumbai, is working on NFTs with rap music and, and new products. So, um, you know, India is happening with NFTs. I'm, I'm in Mumbai at the moment. I'll surely reach out. To okay, T terrific. I see Gustavo Gori wants the mic. Gustavo, are you with us? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I have to start by saying it's a fascinating topic. I, I admire everything you guys, not only what said, but also what you are dedicating your life to. Uh, uh, coming from a, a technical background, engineering, and uh, working supply chain and manufacturing, I, I see uh, uh, this discussion like really, really fascinating. Uh, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I, I try to take the, the the mic is because I, even though my background and my my profession is not in this area, I do have my two kids really involved in both of these areas, and I see the explosive, the explosive combination that you're talking about very clearly. I have one of my kids is in music; she's a singer. My other kid is a is a diplomat; it's a it's a master in diplomacy, and uh, and uh, we both are in. Uh, uh, both are in, in Europe. Uh, we live in Geneva. And, uh, and, and this idea of bringing the power of diplomacy through the arts is simply fascinating. So I wanted to say congratulations. Uh, and I want to see if, uh, if any of you will be open to, uh, to talk further offline after this, uh, uh, because I think this seems to be a, an explosive uh, area for for really delivering bigger and better talent and have your, like these two kids are uh, really spreading the, the world with a message that is there, we probably don't destroy it structurally. Um, uh, I have a feeling that everybody on the panel would be happy to speak <laughs> with you, Gustavo. So well, that, that's good. <laughs> Penny? Can I just add, and this is more of a comment to the earlier, but yes, I, I, I'd i love to follow up with you. Um, you know, so I, and just to follow up on um, Ellen's wonderful comment, um, and I just, and I'd, I'd love to hear what other panelists and audience members think about this. Anything that opens up peer-to-peer -peer is profound and important, but opening up peer-to-peer -peer means nothing if if it's in a context of a gross inequality of wealth and access to resources. And this is where I think, you know, when we think about the state and the government, it, it, it's profoundly depressing, but at least theoretically, there is a place for democratic accountability and, and a redistribution of wealth and, and combat, combating this gross kind of inequality. Whereas when we throw this open, the peer-to-peer -peer is happening only in a corporate world or, or just these kind of platforms of um, whether corporate platforms, then, um, then I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I think it's done enormous damage. I could, I could use a lot of examples. That's where I'm sort of seeing, you know, what I call people to people undiplomacy, mm -hmm. where supposedly open platforms are then used in profoundly violent ways. So we mm -hmm. must have some, you know, some sense of human community and accountability. And, and again, I, I, and I, I, I love Leon's comment about like, 
do not romanticize a nation or like that that is you know we have fallen into these very narrow um ridiculous myths of these national origins that 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 blur um you know, they not only blur complicated histories where we have so many more profound connections, but as humans immediately historically, but it, you know, and it, it also just even blurs a much more immediate history where um, just even decades ago, our, our you know, global histories were, you know, we're emphasizing what we have in common. Yes. We have, um, you know, it, it is it, more than our differences. And that is the whole point of diplomacy. So, yeah, I just, I wonder what people's thoughts are about that. Well, could I jump in on straight on that, Penny? Because you, as, a, as a historian, I found that cultural diplomacy and exchange work best in a context of symmetry and that asymmetry gets in the way. So I think that the it, it, one of the great miracles of exchange and cultural diplomacy is the rapprochement between France and Germany. That happened because those countries were so were so similar. Mm. If you look at how the same ideas like town twinning played out in the United States, sure they built uh, connections, but they were hierarchical or hier hier hierarchized. Uh, and I think that uh, that undermined to some extent the. Uh, potential of the exchange. Now, we have great inequalities of wealth, and it's going to be hard to uh, work to resolve those. But what we must have is symmetries of respect. And the key to the successful exchanges with the Soviet Union in the 1980s, when we actually had a successful information disarmament process, backing away from one another's propaganda, was that we respected them as an equivalent uh, uh, an equivalent power with their own stories and their own place in the world that disappeared as uh, you know as you've written about at the end of the cold war and we moved into a different uh, asymmetrical situation where exchange was much harder both where we insisted on being the teacher and where uh, we, uh, kind of fell into uh, being the, the a, a supplicant and uh, i i think we're now paying the price for 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 that undiplomacy. Absolutely. You know, what What do you think about the fact that back in the day that you're talking about historically, the State Department was sending famous, really established artists um, with big names um, in, in a way to counter the Bolshoi and the, you know, the opera and so forth that was coming out of the Soviet Union. Um, and in our case, and in many cases, the Bond Street Theater is an example smaller arts organizations that are really dedicated to working with populations that may or may not have any tools or resources, but we help them to see that, that they can be creative. Well, that I, they can I, have I a think voice. that Junius is doing a terrific job uh, and I, uh, his budget is, is tiny uh, and it's all the more amazing what he's able to do. But part of the secret of Next Level is that it is participatory. And it's not sit down, shut up, and listen to my mastery of this art form. It's there you let's go. work together. Let's create something together. Let's build something uh, together, which is part of the principle of hip hop. And uh, hip hop is always, as an art form, um, made something out of limited resources. And I think it's quite appropriate that uh, when limited resources are available for the Department of State, that it actually be working with an art form that's used to to that but that is achieving tremendous amounts by working with uh together to create new things that haven't existed before and technology helps to carry on after the live program is over i'm sure that junius has dozens of or hundreds of facebook friends or instagram followers who met him and met his his uh team overseas and those friendships continue on so we're, we are, that's one example of where the use of technology has been a great boon to cultural diplomacy. Um, so that it's not over when it's, when the live project is over. If I, if I may, I, I want to um, thank you, um, Nick, for those, those kind words and, and also Penny. Um, one of the things that, that we believe at, at Next Level is that if, if people are our purpose, then their agency has to be a priority. 
And in, in hip hop culture, we, we, we're examples of how this can go wrong in a lot of ways. And, and this program allows us the opportunities to do now instead of just a basic exchange where it's performative, we do a show, you do a show. We've been able to establish performing rights, professional development programs, where we have hired artists to actually work with student collaborators and teach them how to monetize um, their skill sets within their communities, where aerosol artists are doing um, album covers for the EPs that the beat makers and the DJs and the MCs make and the videos that the dance are forming in. Um, this program uh, allows us to do that, but it, it wasn't from a place of that we just decided, oh yeah, this would be great. And you know, it wasn't a program thing. It was a, a process thing. It was from connecting with people and student collaborators saying, so now what? When you leave, you get to go back and you get to make an album and you get to be a superstar and we're here wishing. So these programs, you know, these cultural diplomacy programs um, in the right hands change lives. And, and yes, make those connections that are lifelong because, you know, connections that I made in 97, um, I'm still connected with them today. And we have ECA to thank for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to say uh, on that note, Junius, you know, um, I did mention this because I, I don't, for, I don't uh, forefront this, but I'm a woman in tech. And I can tell you that going to different countries and being a woman in new tech is really uh, incredibly inspiring for women who show up in the workshop. And, you know, I don't present myself in any dialogue that there's anything special about that, but I can guarantee you the inspiration that the women participants feel is tremendous because tech is very gender biased, mm. you know, high tech. So I just want to say that uh, in, in relationship to what Junius said, you know, and you don't know whose lives you're changing just by showing up in an area. So Junius, that I just wanted to add to that, that you're right. Well, it's Friday night and everybody wants to go out and party, I know. So um, I think this has been a, a remarkably inspiring conversation. I'm so grateful that you all made the time to join. Um, thank you to our audience. I, I see more people in the audience than I saw on any of the other panels that I went to earlier. So maybe there's something sexy and fun about cultural diplomacy, even during pandemic and wartime. Mm. That thank was, you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for joining and have a good evening. And we'll look and share this um, on YouTube later on. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.